On any given weekend, large groups of people come together to compete in marathons. A 26.2 mile test of human endurance, speed, and personal pride. Everyone starts from the same point regardless of their experience or ability. And each will succeed without regard to how well others do. Every marathoner chooses to run with the goal of making the best of his or her talent and the effort put into training. For a few, the goal is setting a new world record. For others, it's completing the race regardless of how long it takes. Setting a personal best. Running with friends. How they get there is up to them. They share the pleasure of reaching the finish line without being given any special advantage. Choosing how to make a living is similar to running a marathon. We all have different goals based on our interest and curiosity. We want a job that meets our needs, but we also want the satisfaction of knowing success was based on our talent, experience, and effort. By pursuing our personal dream, pushed along by ambition, each of us will have the best possible outcome. So how does this affect you? What's your goal in life? Where will you be in five or ten years? And how will you get there? Whatever your choice, and it is your choice, you have all the freedom in the world to pursue your individual dream. That freedom was literally spelled out for you and for every American in the Declaration of Independence in 1776. It said, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But even before 1776, there were Africans brought forcefully to America as slaves. In the mid-1800s, there was deadly mob violence protesting the presence of Irish Catholics in New York and Philadelphia. And in 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act to halt Chinese immigration for 10 years and prohibit Chinese from becoming American citizens. Women didn't get the right to vote until 1920, and as recently as 1941, Americans of Japanese ancestry were forcefully moved into government detention camps. They were American citizens who were suddenly thought to be a threat to our national security following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. As the Civil War was grinding to a close, President Abraham Lincoln championed a 13th Amendment to the Constitution that would outlaw slavery. It was the first of three amendments known as the Reconstruction Amendments. The 14th, which was passed a year after his death, took it one step further, with a clause that guarantees equal protection under the law to all people. Still, it was many years before women were given the vote and many more before segregation was actually ended. In fact, discrimination was part of the very fabric of America until the 1960s, when pressured by public outcry, politicians and activists pressed the government for stronger action. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy issued an executive order using the term affirmative action to describe a policy requiring federal agencies to treat all job applicants and employees without regard to race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Civil rights activists saw Kennedy's executive order as a call to action. Government officials were told it was no longer enough for them to be colorblind, they needed to be color conscious. Organizations like the Congress of Racial Equality pushed for preferential treatment to make up for the past, and leaders like Urban League President Whitney Young called for a decade of discrimination in favor of Negro youth. But others, like Nobel laureate Milton Friedman, saw this change in direction from non-discrimination to race preference policies as a threat to the goal of freedom and equality. In the 20th century, a very different ideal has begun to emerge. The idea that the economic race should be so arranged that everybody ends at the finish line at the same time, rather than that everyone starts at the beginning line at the same time. Many believe that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, supports that theory. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the President of the United States. But others felt more was needed. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bring him up to the starting line of a race, and then say, you are free to compete with all the others, and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. What began as a way to ensure equal employment opportunity became the launching pad for The Great Society, a sweeping set of affirmative action programs designed to increase the presence of minorities and women in business, government, and schools, not just by prohibiting discrimination, but also by requiring colleges and businesses to give special consideration to race when making employment and admissions decisions. Shelby Steele, senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, believes it was a step in the wrong direction. I don't know the worst thing you can do to people. Johnson said, we can't just put you up to the starting line and let you fight for yourself after what we did. We've got we've to intervene. This is the next and the more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. That was the second, and by my lights, equity. the worst betrayal, because it was a series of programs and ideas that had no faith in black people, had no faith in their fundamental human equality, but had instead a faith in their inferiority. And as Friedman pointed out, it could have large repercussions for society in general. This concept raises a very serious problem for freedom. It is clearly in conflict with it, since it requires that the freedom of some be restricted in order to provide greater benefits to others. You do that to a whole race of people when after centuries of struggle and sacrifice, they finally win freedom and now have the opportunity to really compete on the same terms as everybody else. And you rob them of the opportunity to compete. The fact is, as Johnson himself acknowledged, many black Americans were achieving success decades before affirmative action came into play. The number of Negroes in schools of higher learning has almost doubled in 15 years. The number of non-white professional workers has more than doubled in 10 years. The median income of Negro college women tonight exceeds that of white college women. And there are also the enormous accomplishments of distinguished individual Negroes. And one of them, the first lady ambassador in the history of the United States. Many believe that well-intentioned efforts to level the playing field by giving special consideration based on race and gender unjustly discriminate and can prevent the people you are trying to help from reaching their potential. I saw the other day that uh, black students did worse on, their, on the SAT exam in the year 2000 than they did in the year 1990. Black Americans are behind on, on almost every, any measure you want to look at, socioeconomic measure, academic tests, Highest dropout rate. Wow, that's, uh, that's the effect of the public policy. Walter Williams, distinguished professor of economics at George Mason University and syndicated columnist and author, agrees. In the sports uh, or in the music industry, you don't see any affirmative action. You don't see any lawsuits. What you do see is, is excellence. Today, 80% of the professional basketball players are black, and moreover, the highest paid ones are black. Now, this doesn't represent uh, team owners having a conversion. It represents that there's high talent out there that they just could not ignore. It should be the same way in medicine. Ben Carson, great uh, neurosurgeon of our time, separated Siamese babies joined at the brain. A poor black guy from Detroit with a mother who was illiterate, no father, but took him to the library every Saturday morning. Understood the value of that. The idea of personal freedom is a very radical idea. It's always been. I often tell people that I am very, very happy 
that I got virtually all of my education before it became fashionable for white people to like black people. We were all held to the same standard. You were expected to perform at a level that everybody else, that whites were performing at and so forth, there were no exceptions. And so children from, you know, janitors and uh, so forth and, and fa you know, fast order cooks did very well. After 50 years of government assistance, there is increasing evidence that these programs are not improving the lives of those we intend to help. Over the years, schools like Marva Collins Westside Prep in Chicago and Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C., where the student body is almost exclusively black, have shown another route to success, one that continues to be proven today by schools like the Urban Prep Academies, which provide a comprehensive, high-quality college preparatory education for young men in low-income neighborhoods. Do they have odds to overcome? No doubt. But their creed says it all. We are exceptional, not because we say it, but because we work hard at it. We are dedicated, committed, and focused. We never succumb to mediocrity, uncertainty, or fear. We never fail, because we never give up. We make no excuses. 100% of urban prep students go on to colleges and achieve high success. In America, in my own lifetime, Racial difference has meant less and less. From the beginning, America's strength has been the fact that it is a melting pot. People from different backgrounds, cultures, and genders bring complementary skills that collectively enrich the places where they work and learn. We know now that the diversity of outcomes, in fact, enriches society. And like the marathon runners who share in a sense of achievement, each individual's success is not dependent on the decisions or judgment of others. We all have our own goals and desires. Is your goal a high-powered career or something more artistic? Do you like working with your hands? Or is an academic setting more your style? We all run our own race based on our strengths and differences. And how you prepare for it is what leads you across the finish line. And now, the world is even more open to you. You can express yourself on Facebook and Twitter and see what others are feeling and experiencing. You have no limits based on differences, only strengths. We keep this silly illusion that we're fighting for equality. For the most part, we've got it under the law. We should shift the movement from civil rights, which we've had for 50 years now, to dignity. And there's nobody who can give you dignity. You have to get that on your own.